I'm going to ask you to join me standing. We're in Luke 18, the very next chapter. Chapter 18, verse 1. I'm going to ask you to join me standing. The scripture reads, One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Father, I pray you bless the reading of your word this morning. Father, will you help me to proclaim your message faithfully? Help me to organize my thoughts, Lord, for there are many. And I pray, Lord God, that your message would seep into our hearts and challenge us to walk out of here different than when we walked in. Father, I pray that you transform our minds and our hearts, Lord, that we may be able to test your good and perfect will for our life. Father, I praise you for your mercy and grace, and thank you for this time. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. One of the things that I shared last week, I had the lyrics up here, and I probably don't have them today, and I'd ask you to pull them up on the board, on the, the, camp, the TVs, but the TVs are messed up. I'm going to have somebody look at it this week because this, this has got to get fixed. But the song Hosanna, I shared last week, the, there's, a, there's a part of the song that says, I see a generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith, with selfless faith. Right? You know the song? Uh, I, he, I see a near revival. Right? Isn't that how it goes? Stirring as we pray and sing. Pray and seek. I couldn't remember I see a near revival stirring as we pray and seek. What's this? We're on our knees. That's how it goes. We're on our knees. That's how it goes. Hosanna. It's a term of praise. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. We're like, ooh, it's a beautiful song, and it is. But I said last week, I don't see that generation. I do not see the generation rising up to take their place. The church is backsliding, church. We are not the church we were in the 1950s. And thank God in a lot of ways, because the 1950s church was browbeating a whole lot of people and not showing a whole lot of grace. But this church today, we're all grace and no holiness, and that's wrong. The balance is somewhere in the middle. But we're not the church, all grace, everything goes, everything's cool, and it's not. This generation is not rising up to take its place. I believe that generation preceded us. Abraham asked the Lord, would he spare Sodom and Gomorrah for, you know, so many righteous men? And he kept bartering with God, bartering with God. Come on, how about 10? Will you sit fair for 10? And he couldn't even get 10. And so God judged Sodom and Gomorrah. There was a lack, there was no remnant in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's why it came. The flood came because there was only eight righteous souls on earth, the whole earth, eight people who feared God. So he drowned everybody and started fresh. So the church today, to be honest with you, the church today is, is politically correct and lackadaisical as we are, is still enough of a remnant, remnant for God to tarry. God is slow to judge because he wants everyone to come unto repentance. So there's still a godly remnant on earth, which is why God has not, the Son of Man has not yet returned. The gospel needs to be preached to the four corners of the world. So you say, all right, what, what are you getting at? I'm glad you asked. The godly generation is not rising up to take their place. I see a near revival. Do you see it? I don't. I don't. Those big tent revivals back in the day, we could, I bet you we couldn't have one today. I bet you if we rented Wicker Park or something and put up a big old tent and if we got preachers coming, unless you got somebody like Billy Graham coming, I don't know that we'd, I don't think we'd fill it out. In fact, I know a pastor who said, I got a great idea. Why don't we get the associational tent, pitch it, and invite all the churches? And somebody told me that's not going to work these days. Things are different. The revival. I don't see it, and it is a revival. It is God's remnant that will slow the Lord's coming. It's not going to stop it because the Bible teaches Jesus will return. But this is our responsibility. We don't believe the rapture is going to happen tomorrow. We don't believe it can happen today. It could happen right now. We don't believe that. We say we do intellectually, but we don't believe that. Not in our heart, we don't. So Jesus tells a story after 
he tells the story about the kingdom of God. This is the subsequent story in chapter 18 of the book of Luke, verses 1 through 8. The scripture reads, one day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. Oh, I had one last thought regarding the whole, the rapture thing. If we believe that, it would change the way we, the way we live. And my example of that would be this. And I meant to ask for permission first, uh, and I didn't get a chance to, but Miss Stephanie is here every Sunday, usually, with almost, almost every Sunday. I said out of 52 Sundays, she might miss two in a year, maybe. And she's always back there prepared to teach a lesson to our little ones. And many Sundays, there's nobody there. It's just her. Am I correct, Miss Stephanie? She nods. And I'm sorry to put you on the spot like that, but the, my point is not, not to praise her, but it is. I praise God that we have someone with that kind of passion and commitment. But my point is, she believes investing in these children is important. You might not have tomorrow for whatever reason. But we don't believe that. We don't, we don't live like that. If we did, we put our all into everything, the things that we do. We as a church for years have it. We're not even knocked on doors. We started doing that recently. We have no kingdom mentality. My ticket's punched. I'm going to heaven. Everyone else can go to hell. That's what you say with your actions. That's what we say, church, not just our church. So Jesus teaches this story. One day his disciples, he told his disciples a story, how they should always pray and never give up. See, these two things dovetail because we do know that Jesus says that the harvest is plentiful and the labors are few, right? And he says, pray, therefore, that the Lord of the harvest will send his workers out. But in this passage, look at this. This is an incredible passage. Jesus finished teaching in the previous chapter, in the subsequent chapter of uh, Luke, or the previous chapter in Luke. He's teaching about trials are coming your way, church. They're coming. It's not the question of if. The question is when and how and how many. Maybe it's unemployment. Maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's divorce. Who knows? Maybe it's death. But when those trials come, we know that God's grace can get us through it. Amen? And the biggest key to unlock that is prayer. And we don't pray as we ought to. So Jesus says, pray and never give up. Verse 2. There was a judge. I love Jesus. Jesus gives illustrations all the time. He gives analogies. He gives pictures, word pictures, so that we could see. There was a judge in a certain city. Sounds like Hammond. Who, never, who neither feared God or cared about people. I want to stop there for a second. There was a judge in a certain city, a judge who neither feared God or cared about people. Those two things that are mentioned in that very verse are, encompass the first two commandments. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and all your strength, and to love people, love your neighbor as yourself. This guy could care less about either. In other words, he was an ungodly judge. That's amazing to me that you could have a judge who sits in a judicial gown behind the bench who's supposed to hold the laws and he could care less about people or God. And I'm thinking, that guy surely doesn't exist, does he? Absolutely he does. And God forbid that's the judge you ever have to stand in front of. Amen? Lord have mercy. I just look at that and I think, wow, that's extraordinary to me. And a lot of these judges, check this out, a lot of these judges can retire. Like these federal judges, if they, if they make like $200,000 a year, they can retire and still get paid, not lose a dime. Then you got this old and gray judge who can barely see and can't hear, falling asleep on the bench during a trial who won't retire. Why? He won't lose no money. It's power. So let's check this out. Jesus says, there's a certain judge who doesn't care about people and could care less about God. Verse 3, a widow of that city came to him. I'm going to stop there. Widows and orphans were society's most vulnerable people. Widows in that culture, they couldn't take care of themselves. Women were second class, third class citizens, maybe. They couldn't do anything for themselves. So if a widow, if a lady became a widow, uh, it was, she, she was on her own, pretty much. So if Tina and I are married, which we are, and I was to croak tomorrow, She'd be a widow. In our culture, she'd have options. In their culture, she didn't. It would be the responsibility of one of my brothers to step in and take care of her. If I didn't have any brothers, 
She's got a problem. So the widows and the orphans were the two biggest, uh, the most vulnerable classes of people in this culture. So this widow, who has apparently has nobody, or that person would be doing her work for her, comes to a judge who could care less about God or about people. So she comes to this judge asking for something she rightfully deserves. Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. And the judge ignores her for a while. But finally, he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. No, this, right there, the scripture implies that's his wife. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't stone me. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant requests. Okay? He says, I don't fear God, and I don't care about people, so I'm not motivated to do anything for this lady. I could care less. But she's driving me crazy. The original language actually implies, uh, the actual picture that's painted is that she's giving him a black eye, like a boxer. So you're literally in a ring. It's like Muhammad Ali used to do to his, his opponents. He just wear them out. Muhammad Ali would get in the ring and say, because you're talking jive, I'm going to knock you out in five meaning the fifth round. Muhammad Ali was the king of trash talking, and he'd tell you what round he was going to knock you out in. Now, you tell me what was he doing in the first four rounds. He's playing with you. Playing with you. Could have knocked you out in the first round. And so he's playing with you, and, he's jet and then by the fifth round, you're tired, you're all lumped up, and then he hits you with the wood when he puts you down, and he knocks you out cold. The, the picture here, the judges say, this woman's wearing me out. She's driving me crazy. Is that, that she's just, she's pummeling him. She just keeps pounding them. She keeps pounding them. The judge is like, goodness gracious. Just to get her out of my face, just to strip her. I'm going to go ahead and do what she's asking me to do. Now, the judge ignored her for a while, but he finally came to himself, said to himself, I don't fear God or I don't care about people. So that was not his motivation. But this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see she gets justice, not just send her on her way, but that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant request. Remember the first verse. One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. Always pray and never give up. Always pray and never give up. If the screens were working, I was going to ask Enrique to pull up the picture. I've shown this before. The picture is of the pelican that's eating the frog. It's one of my favorite pictures. And the picture of the pelican is sitting there, and his eyeballs are stuck, and they're, they're, all, they're popped out of his head. And if you look at the pelican, you see he has two rear legs of a frog hanging out of his mouth. And you're looking at them, you're like, oh, man, he's eating a frog. And the picture says, never give up. But as you examine the picture a little closer, you see the front arm of the frog is holding the pelican by the throat. He's choking him. So as long as the, the frog keeps choking, the pelican can't swallow him. Can't swallow him. He might get him in the mouth, he might chew him up, wear him out a little bit, but as long as that frog holds on to that throat, the pelican can't swallow him. It's an awesome picture. Looks like it's over, but it's not over until it's over. Amen? Amen. And on my Facebook page, somebody asked me, why don't you have a picture of yourself? Well, first of all, I don't like people looking at me. Um, <laughs> secondly, I don't want to be found by other people. I'm just kidding. But uh, lastly, the, the, the tiger, I have an eye of a tiger. That's my picture. I like that picture. I actually looked on the internet for it to find me a picture of a tiger, and I zoomed in on his eyeball. Why would I do that? What does the eye of the tiger symbolize? Determination. And I'm a very determined man in a lot of areas of my life. Very determined. And I don't give up easy. You know, I'm like, dig them. You smack me, and I smack you back. You know, I, put, I work twice as hard. I want to be good at what I do. I want to do better. And as your pastor, I know I can do better. I know I can do better. That's why last week's sermon really got to me. As I asked myself, as a Christian, I know I can do better. And I want to do better. I want to be better. So Jesus says, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to tell you a story how to put, why you should pray and never give up. Never give up. When I get to the end of my road, this is good for relationships. If you're married and you've been married for an excess period of time, like 30 years, 
when you get, there's going to come a point in your, in your marriage sooner or later where you're going to hit the valleys. Okay, things get rough. You know, you don't bail out because it's inconvenient. If you're at the end of your rope, you tie a knot and you hold on. Amen? And you work it out. You figure it out. This is what we're supposed to do. This is a commitment. It's about determination and perseverance. So Jesus says, I'm going to teach you how to pray. I'm going to show you a story. I'm going to tell you a story about how you should pray and never give up. Now, with that being said, what do we know about this judge? A, he's ungodly. B, he could care less about people. And we also know that he's ignoring a lady who's in a place where she absolutely, positively needs her. If anybody was supposed to come to her aid, it should have been the judge, and he's not. He could care less. So finally, because she's consistently and she's determined, this woman probably had the eye of the tiger tattooed on her forehead. Okay, she is the picture of determination. She's society's lowest rung of the ladder, and she keeps on pushing to the guy who is at the top rung. She keeps pushing. She keeps pushing. She won't take no for an answer. So the judge finally says, all right, fine, goodness, gracious, whatever it's going to take to make you go away. You ever ask somebody like that? I have a daughter like that. I won't tell you which one she is. But when she was a kid, goodness gracious, she'd wear me out. Daddy, can we? I'm like, no. I mean, and just continue and continue and finally. And it wasn't because I was mean, didn't care. It's because no was a good answer. And she's giving me every reason why I should change my mind. Good, intelligent arguments why I should change my mind. I'm like, goodness gracious. And the answer wasn't always no. It was no right now, maybe later. And this is true with God as our father. God's our perfect father. He's not going to tell you no just to be mean. If he tells you no, it's no now, for now. Maybe it's yes later. Maybe it's wait. We don't want to hear wait. To us, wait means no. Daddy, can we go to the park? Yeah, we can go to the park. Today? No, not today. Maybe tomorrow. That means no. i like, no, I'm telling you I'm going to take you to the park. I just can't take you today. Well, that's a no. Brandon said something to me this morning. He said, delayed obedience is disobedience. Absolutely true. But we as kids, we want instant gratification. We want God to give us what we want right here, right now. And if he don't, well, then God's just being mean. Well, God knows something you don't know. In fact, he knows a lot you don't know. And sometimes the answer is not right now. And for us, we hear that's a no. And we thumb our nose at God. And then we go out and do it our way. The passage where Jesus said we're walking in darkness when we're functioning outside of the light. We're walking on our own, thinking we can figure this out. And we fall on our face and we wonder why. Amen? So what do we see here? Finally, the judge says, fine, lady, I'm going to give you what you want so you can get out of my face. Verse 6 says, then the Lord said, learn a lesson from the unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision. See, he didn't grant the lady what she wanted because she's just because she got on her nerves, but he granted it to her because it was right. Amen? It was the right thing to do. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. Even he, the ungodly judge who could care less about people, made the right decision, did the right thing at the end, even he did it. Don't you think God, who is good all the time, will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? First of all, why? There's a million reasons why. But why would God not answer your question or your, your original request right off the bat? Well, for one, he's not an ATM machine. You don't just put your prayer card in, punch in your code, and get what you want. It's not that simple. Okay, it's not. God does answer selfish prayer requests when you're a baby Christian. I know every silly prayer request I ever offered up, he answered them. I believe he did that to show me he was real and that he was listening and that he cared. But God's not going to leave you there forever. It's just like the, I now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. She said, if I shall die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. We teach that to little kids, right? Rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub. Yay, God. You know that prayer? You sit down to eat? You never pray that prayer? <laughs> it's an easy one. You teach the kid. You know, and you teach them it's cute because they're little, but you, and you want them to learn the concept of being thankful. So you teach them these simple, easy prayers. Um, 
God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for this food. Amen. That's another one, right? Mm -hmm. Easy stuff. We teach it to the kids to teach them so how to pray. But do you think God wants the 80-year-old Jose Burgos still praying like that? <laughs> and now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And God wants me to grow beyond that. Mm -hmm. Amen? God wants me to grow beyond the rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub. Yay, God. He wants me to grow beyond that. Are you following me? So what happens is when you pray these prayers and God says, wait, we hear no, God wants you to persevere in your prayer life so that you grow. You think I can, I want, I want arms like Bob Hamilton. I want some big guns. You think I'm going to go to the gym today, grab some dumbbells, do 10 reps each, and I'm going to have them tomorrow? Nope. Don't work that way. Those guns come with time. Got to put the time in. Amen? So if physical strength and physical conditioning comes from physical activity over an extended period of time, do you not think that your spiritual stamina, your spiritual strength is going to come to you over a period of time? Absolutely. God can pour it all into you right here, right now, but you wouldn't really be grateful. It builds character. It builds perseverance. These kids who play football, these high school kids blow me away, their level of commitment. Blow me away at their level of commitment. They're out there before school, you know, practicing. They'll, they'll come out uh, in the summertime and do two a days. They hit it in the morning, hit it in the evening. Wrestlers in high school are dropping 10, 15 pounds to cut weight, to, to, to wrestle in a weight class. I mean, determination. They're, con they're committed. They're all in. And they do it for an extended period of time. It doesn't happen overnight. So Jesus is saying, listen, you need to pray. Be persistent in your prayer life. It will help you develop spiritually. Amen? Amen. I knew a kid who wrestled. I think he, went to, he played football in high school. Wasn't getting a whole lot of playing time, and he was a stud. The kid was a total athlete. He said, I'm going to stop playing football, and I'm going to wrestle. He's a junior. I looked at him, maybe a sophomore. I said, dude, first of all, you, you, you know, first of all, you're, you're in high school, you're a sophomore, you're a junior, whatever he was, late in the game for you to get into wrestling. Some of these kids have been wrestling since they were five and six years old. He goes, yeah, but I'm strong, and he was a beast. He got inside the mat, got on the mat a couple times with a couple people, and he was able to pin them because there's brute strength. Nothing you can do with brute strength. If somebody's way stronger than you, there's nothing you can do about it. You're just going to muscle them every time. However, what counters strength is technique. Precision. When you start wrestling long enough, you get into the when you get through the regular season, you get into the sectionals, you're gonna come across somebody who's just as strong as you are and has got way more technique than you ever could dream of because he's been doing this since he was five. And that's exactly what happened. He got his behind handed to him in the sectionals. He never advanced. He said, Man, these guys are good. I, I, what's my point here? My point is that the, the stamina, the strength, the conditioning of the kid who's been wrestling since he was five and six years old versus the newcomer. It takes time to develop these things, yet there's Christians who sat in the pews their whole life and never developed. They're still the five-year-old. I've been wrestling since I was five. Well, do you have something to show for a Christian? How is your walk? Is it developing? Are you closer to God today than you were yesterday? Or are you closer to God today than you were last, last year at this time? Are you better? Do you pray better? Are you more consistent? Do you serve, which is another, whole nother sermon, so Jesus says, even this judge rendered a just decision in the end. Don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Or do you think God will keep putting them off? You know, I thought about the children of Israel. You know how many years they were in captivity? Anybody know? The, the children of Israel, when they got locked, when they were, uh, when, they, when they got, when Joseph was slow, sl sold into slavery. 400, 430 years. It was 400 years. 400 years. 400 years. America's not 400 years old that they were enslaved. And when he delivers them, when God finally delivers them, you know what he says? I heard the cry of my people is what God says. And you're like, 
You've been crying for 400 years, Lord. Did you just hear? 400 years. To us, generations are passing. For God, he just blinked his eyes. Time is nothing to God. So when we, I know a lady who prayed for the salvation of her son for years. But she told me, I know that God's going to answer that prayer. But she answered it when the guy's like 50. God answered this lady's prayer when her son was like 50 years old. She goes, I talked to her. I said, ain't that something? She goes, God knew it was a done deal. She had faith and confidence that God was going to answer that prayer that she's been praying for 50 years. Old school saints will tell you that's normal. New school saints were a microwave. We're a microwave. Uh, we're microwave saints. Yeah. And that's not because we're red hot for the Lord. It's because we want answers now. Remember when I was in middle school and the teacher told me we got microwave ovens. I said, what? He said, you can go make a hot dog, put it on the bun, dress it up, and eat it before the commercial is over. I'm like, yeah, right. Because we had to boil them back then, right? Yeah. Steam the buns on top of that screen thing. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I want the popcorn. You had to shake inside the thing so it didn't burn. You know what I'm talking about. Man, that stuff don't fly today. Microwave. And the microwave ain't quick enough. Get mad when somebody shuts the curry off and it takes a minute to warm up. Seriously? We want everything right here, right now, and we try to apply that to our spiritual life, but God doesn't work that way. Amen? So Jesus says, stay persistent in your prayer. Look, if this nasty, no good, rotten scoundrel judge is going to answer this woman's request because it's a just request, don't you think God, who is perfect and good all of the time, is going to answer the request and bring justice to those people, his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Maybe it's 400 years down the road. Maybe it's 50 years down the road. Maybe it's 50 days. But that ain't quick enough for us. We want 50 seconds tops, Lord. We might deal with 50 minutes. Outside of that, we're pathetic, church. We're a pathetic society. Who we feel entitled. God doesn't owe us anything. He says, but I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many, how many, how many will he find on earth who had faith? That kind of faith. It's a good question. How many? I think there's fewer of those Christians today than they were 50 years ago. And I think 50 years from now, there will be even fewer. I have nothing to base that on except my own opinion. No support. Look at verse 9. Then Jesus told them, Jesus told them this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. I, I, let me read the passage. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. The other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not a sinner like everyone else, especially this guy over here, for I do not cheat. I do not sin like this one over here, and I surely don't commit adultery like that one over there. I'm certainly not like the tax collector, that no good such and such, for I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income, Lord. That's his prayer. Wow, is right. That's extraordinary prayer, and I don't mean that in a good way. Have been praying that prayer? Oh, Lord, I am so grateful. Thank you, Lord, that you made me the way you made me and not like you made Frank. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that I got a full head of hair and not bald like my man Anthony. You know, or thank God that I don't got to be as hairy as this dude, Nick, you know. He's got enough hair on him to weave an Indian basket. Thank you, Lord. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm praying these prayers. Wow, <laughs> really? You know what, though, church? We may not pray that prayer, and I pray you don't. Lord, have mercy if you do. But we display that attitude. It's a self-righteous attitude that I'm better than you. You know what? You struggle with addiction. You. Not you. You. This guy over here. 
this guy. This guy's an addict. Whatever substance, pick your poison, doesn't even matter. This guy struggles with that. And I tell Luke all about this guy and his struggles and what a waste he is. Thank God me ain't like him. Wow. I'm steady gossiping, and he's entertaining me. Thank God we ain't like him, right? Yeah, give me fist bump. Boom. Now let's go tell Frank about this clown. Frank. And we're telling Frank, and Frank's like, ooh, really? Ooh, hate to be his wife. Ooh. So Frank chimes in. Thank God we ain't like him. Aren't you? Yeah. Well, you are like him. <laughs> You're very much like him. And if you could have, I said this a million times, one of those billboards scrolling across your forehead where you stand in the mirror and you look at, and you could read your sins, you would not want to, you would not want to look in the mirror. I promise you. You want to turn it off, rip it off, throw it away or something. And you surely wouldn't want anyone else to see it. You'd pull a hood on or something over your forehead to hide it. A bandana like we used to do when we break dance. But you would cover that thing up. Amen? So this guy's sin is on display for all to see. Yours may be deep in here that nobody knows about. And you say, thank God I ain't like him, but you are like him. Let's look at the text again. What do we know about the Bible? The Bible says that if you say that you have no sin, you are a, you are a liar, right? Jesus told this story. Some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scored, scorned other people. Two men went to the temple to pray, one Pharisee, and the other one was a despised tax collector. So one was esteemed, the other's despised. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. By himself, praying out loud so people can hear how great he is. Lord, I thank you, God, that I am not a sinner. Lie. Like everyone else. You're a liar. Because the Bible says, for all have sinned. Amen? that I am not a sinner like everyone else. For I don't cheat, I don't sin, lie, and I don't commit adultery. Let's say that the cheat and the adultery part are true. There's a sin of pride that I can sense here in the passage. There's a sin of judgment that I can, I can sense in the passage. And certainly not like this tax collector. Lord, have mercy, really? And now look at the sin of self-righteousness. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of my income. Dude, you, you still are a sinner. You could never make yourself presentable to God. Never enough. The Bible says, do I not set aside the grace of God? Because if righteousness could be earned through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Think about that. If there was any other way to, uh, to uh, earn God's favor in your life, then Jesus didn't have to die. He had to die because there's nothing you can do. I don't care how many times a week you fast, and I don't care how much money you give. I don't care how much money you serve. If you haven't accepted Jesus' sacrifice for your life, you are still dead in your sins. Verse 13, but the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. And I can relate to this guy. You know, sometimes we... Uh, we sing songs about how great God is, and I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine looking up at heaven. Sometimes a, a sense of gratitude and a sense of humility so great overwhelms me that I want to bow in humble adoration, and I want to prostrate myself on the floor, feeling that I can't even make myself low enough to be in the presence of God Almighty. I know who I am. I don't need anyone else to point out my flaws. I know what they are. And I know that I am not worthy to enter into God's presence. I know that. And I also know that there is nothing that I could do that would ever put me there other than accept the gift that God has given me in Jesus Christ. That, I understand that. We sing that song, I can only imagine. Will I stand in your presence or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. The, the temple of God and the train of his robe and the angels in, in heaven, I can't even begin to, I can't even begin to imagine. I always said that, you know what, if I ever seen a celebrity, you know, they're just celebrities. They're just famous people. 
I wouldn't over, be overwhelmed. I mean, they're just celebrities. <laughs> Who cares, right? They put their pants on like I do, one leg at a time. And if it wasn't for their fans, they wouldn't be celebrities. We were in Florida. Tina and I were in Miami, and a dude walked in. Somebody said, that's Nicky Jam. That's Nicky Jam. I don't know who Nicky Jam is. You know who he was to me? A Hispanic dude with a tattoo. He walked into the, to the restaurant, and he looked at me like that. I was like that, and he kept walking at me. I'm like, whatever, and the girls behind the counter like, woo-hoo. But he's a, they're fans, so he's somebody to them. He's nobody to me. Celebrities are celebrities because they have people who make them celebrities. Amen? I always said, you know what? I would never be overwhelmed. And I, that's proof. Nicky Jam is proof, right? Wrong. Because I didn't know who he was. Now, true story, Tina and I were at the casino eating at the buffet, not gambling. And, uh, and this was years ago. And uh, you remember this? We're sitting there eating. I still had a 35 millimeter camera. Okay? So we're sitting here. And uh, it was a party from work. I was having a party from work. And this dude walks in. And it was, it was, it was Norm Van Leer. How many of you know who Norm Van Leer is? <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a retired Chicago Bull. He played, you know, he's a, a commentator on, on ESPN. And so uh, he walked in, and I was ready to bite my chicken leg. I went, I dropped it. I go, that's Norm Van Leer. And Tina goes, who? And I said, Norm Van Leer. And she looked at me like, who? And I was gone. <laughs> so I, I ran up, that's exact. I ran up to Norm Van Leer. Come here, Frank. I grabbed my hand. I said, Mr. Van Leer, hey, Mr. Van Leer, how you doing, Mr. Van Leer? I can't believe it. And he's like this. He's talking to somebody else. And then I got a hold of myself. I realized, Jose, you're being rude. You just cut right into the middle of the conversation. And I'm like, oh, 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 like, my bad. I'm trying to back away. But he wouldn't let go of my hand. He pulls me back. And then he finished talking to the guy. And then he looks at me and he says, what's your name? And I said, Jose. And he says, nice to meet you. He says, call me Norm. I said, OK, Mr. Van Leer. <laughs> And I, t I, I had my camera. I told Tina, give me your camera. And Tina brings the camera. I had the camera. He handed it to this other dude. And I'm like this. Ah, and I got their picture somewhere. And I'm like this. Yeah, I got it. Norm Van Leer. I'm like this. And he, and he did this. He, he put his arm around me. He pulled me close. And I'm like, this is Mr. Bull, man. This is, this is Norm. We take a picture. I'm like, shh, shh. He says, hey, nice to meet you, Jose. I said, thank you, Mr. Van Leer. He said, you're welcome. He took the picture. I took the camera back. I sat down. And Tina goes, what the heck was that? <laughs> Right? He's just Norm. Man, I lost my stuff. When I saw him, I lost my stuff. I'm like, man, it's Norm Van Leer. That's just Norm Van Leer. He's fallible, he's human, and he's dead today. It's just Norm. What if you met the president? I know how you feel about the president. I know. What if you met the president? What if you met uh, a king from another country? I mean, you, you, you esteem these people. Those people are nothing, nothing compared to God. And we stand in his presence because we've been forgiven because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We enter into this throne room of God and are able to access this throne because of what Jesus has done. I relate to the tax collector. I relate to the tax collector. Sometimes I can hardly lift my eyes towards heaven. He says, the tax collector stood at a distance, dared not lift his eyes towards heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow. You ever do that? Dang it, man, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Think, Jose. You ever do that? Am I alone? No. Amen. Amen. So this guy's beating his chest in sorrow, saying, oh, God, be merciful to me. Be merciful to me, for I'm a sinner. And I tell you this, sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home, justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Amen? I share this passage, the two, the persistent widow. Jesus is teaching, listen, the hard times are going to come your way. The only way to persevere through that is in prayer. Amen? That's the only way. God's provision will prevail. God's going to take care of you. He's going to sustain you. Trust me. It may not be in your time. I'm going to be honest with you, church. If I lost my job today, I'd be scrambling to find another one quickly. And I'd be praying and asking God to provide it quickly. And if God chose to wait months before he answered that prayer, I would keep praying and keep wondering and keep hoping. 
But the truth is, I'd want that prayer answered today. And if God doesn't answer that prayer today, there's got to be a reason for that. You keep praying anyway, and you persevere. Sickness, you have a family member who's sick, and you pray for the, for the healing. And it doesn't come right away. You keep praying. You keep praying, and you trust and believe that God can and will answer your prayers. you got to have faith. If he's a just God, which he is, if he's good, which he always is, then he's going to hear your he's going to hear your prayer he has already heard it and he's going to answer it according to his perfect will and according to his timeline and we can't always understand why the delay as in the Lazarus case when they said Jesus your friend is sick and Jesus waited 2 days before he went there's if God delays in answering your prayer you may not have an answer as to why but you can rest assured that there's purpose there's a reason and maybe this side of heaven you won't get it. But we have to trust and obey anyway. Amen? Amen? Ask the praise team to come forward as I close with this final thought. The second thought I want to give you one is this one. The, the story of this, this Pharisee. Last week when I talked, I said I was at the wedding. The bride of the wedding asked me to, to include in the sermon 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, which says, above all else, put on love. For love covers a multitude of sins. The Bible calls us to love one another as brothers and sisters over and over and over again. And that takes a supernatural power of God to do because some of us are easier to love than others. Let's just be honest. Personalities clash. It's just the way it is. But it doesn't excuse the fact that we've been called to love each other. And if we're not careful, the people we love less are those who are struggling with the sins that we can't relate to. I'm not a gambler. I don't have a gambling problem. So I'm going to judge the brother who gambles a lot harsher than I would a person who lies because I'm a liar and can't keep my big mouth shut. Or I'm not an alcoholic. I don't even drink booze. But I'm going to judge the person who drinks booze a whole lot harsher than I would uh, a person who gossips because I'm a gossip and can't keep my big mouth shut. Whatever it is, the sin that you struggle with, we tend to be a little more compassionate with that one. It's a lesser sin. And we can tolerate people on a whole other level. But those who struggle with sins we don't normally struggle with, they're easier to, to browbeat. And if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves with the attitude of the Pharisee. Lord, I thank you that I am not a gambler like him. I thank you that I'm not an alcoholic like him. I thank you that I don't sin. You do sin. I promise you, you do. And that is evidence of it. Church, we need to humbly come into God's presence, thank him for his grace in our life, and ask him for the grace to love others the way you love yourself. You ask him to grow in the grace of loving him even more. When you love him more, you can love others more. It doesn't work any other way. Tying back into last week's sermon, if you truly believe that the rapture could happen today, doggone it, we need to start living like it. Because we don't. We don't. Walking around with a self-righteous attitude doesn't win people to Christ. It doesn't. It keeps people out of the church. Many of the people I talk to today who say, I don't go to church today, if they used to go to church and don't know more because they've been burned by the church by that self-righteous attitude. And we're all sinners. We're all in need of God's grace and his forgiveness and his mercy. And he offers it. So church, I want you to think about, think about that. Where are you at in that? Are you humbly and gratefully accepting the grace of God in your life? Or have you found yourself kind of leaning the other way? And I don't like to use the word legalistic because there's nothing wrong with holy living nothing wrong with that at all. If you strive to live a life that honors God in every area of your life, that's what you should do. But realize you didn't start there. There was a process for you to get there. Don't turn your nose up at other people who aren't where you're at. You should reach back and help them get there. I want you to ask yourself, where are you at? Where are you at? Are you on the mercy side and grace side? Or are you on the wrath and judgment side? We need to be somewhere in the middle. The Bible teaches that.